pass the floor to uh, Dominic Balashka. Thank you, Boris. And good afternoon to everybody. It's a pleasure for me to be here today to introduce Professor Steph Alpers, a cultural sociologist from the Catholic University of Leuven. Professor Alpers is well known in sociology of religion for his work with Nick Hotman and for publications like Beyond the Spiritual Supermarket, The Social and Public Significance of a new age spirituality, the spiritual turn and the decline of tradition, the spread of post-Christian spirituality in 14 Western countries, or religions of modernity relocating the sacred to the self and the digital. His main research focus is on the elective affinity between digital technology and religion, but he published articles about diverse topics ranging from religion to spirituality, conspiracy theories or media, and game culture. Today, Professor Alpers will present his work, Things Greater Than Do, AI, and a Technical Reenchantment of the World. Um, with this, I think that the presentation is over, and I wish you uh, a pleasant hour, and hopefully no technical issues will be there. So, uh, Professor Alpers, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dominique. Uh, I hope uh, everybody can hear me and see me just somewhere in the corner of my PowerPoint presentation as a talking head. Um, okay, so uh, we're going to talk uh, today in this in the coming 25 minutes uh, about uh, AI and technical re-enchantment of the world. Uh, and for starters, uh, I want to introduce a figure that I guess uh, some of you, perhaps most of you, uh, have heard of, know perhaps also his work, uh, which is uh, Ray Kurzweil, um, who's on the one hand, and this is a typical situation, on the one hand, uh, really a well-known uh, inventor uh, and, and, and techie guy, basically, uh, uh, famous for uh, being active in the, in the field of uh, optical character recognition, speech, re uh, speech recognition, pattern recognition uh, through software in general uh, and very vocal also uh, on other domains like artificial intelligence, uh, biotech, nanotech and other elements here. So Ray Kurzweil is very much on the one hand in one, you could say with one leg, he's, uh, he's very much active in the, in, the, in the field of technology. Since 2012, he's also uh, a, a director engineering at Google. Uh, so he's not an obscure, eccentric guy, but very active and on the frontier of technological development. On the other hand, and here comes the sort of uh, angle that I will take, he's also uh, very vocal in expressing ideas uh, about the future. Ideas that are on the one hand very much grounded in technological developments, and at the same time very much uh, um, uh, are, are very much related to uh, religious discourses. So uh, some of his, his ideas about uh, uh, machines are that they can essentially, uh, well, he calls them spiritual machi machines, but they will that that machine intelligence will exceed human intelligence in the nearby future. Um, that artificial intelligence increasingly will compete with uh, human beings uh, in the nearby future and that human beings will become transhuman or post-human because uh, if they want to keep up with this evolution, they basically have to implant all kinds of devices, including chips, including nanotechnology and including artificial intelligence. So he's a techie guy, but at the same time, he's, he's utopian and more or less religious in his discourses because ultimately, and we will talk about that later, He's also uh, hinting at a future where we can uh, 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 basically upload our consciousness in a machine, a computer, a robot, or on the internet. So here you see the convergence already as an illustration between uh, uh, technology, secular technology, uh, and religious worldviews, basically. But I want to start basically with, um, um, and here's some of his his stuff, again, like uh, recognized by Bill Gates, uh, arguing that Ray, Ray Kurzweil is the best person I know at predicting the future, future of artificial intelligence. His intriguing new book envisions a future in which information technologies have advanced so far and fast 
that they enable humanity to transcend its biological limitations, transforming our lives in ways we can't yet imagine. So I want to start theoretically the, the, the debate uh, with, uh, with the work of Max Weber, which is obviously a classical uh, perspective, a classical theory about uh, uh, developments in uh, the Western modern world that he uh, expressed uh, at the beginning, basically, of the, of the 20th century. Uh, and his main thesis, as most of you uh, probably know, was that modern society, unlike more Eastern societies, uh, he argued in an ideal typical ways, uh, were basically uh, dominated increasingly by instrumental rationality. That is, uh, um, uh, uh, thinking in terms of uh, means and relating them to particular goals, thinking in terms of efficiency, etc., etc., in opposition to value rationality, that is, reflecting on morality, reflecting on aesthetics, reflecting on ethics, etc., etc. So, in his work, he used an, a lot of examples uh, of domains and institutions that are dominated by instrumental rationality, uh, that is, uh, bureaucracies, basically, function on instrumental rationality. Um, uh, business companies uh, function on instrumental rationality or are organized in that way. But also science and technology are very much centered around um, uh, 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 instrumental rationality. So his, 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 his claim about the disenchantment of the world was very much based on that, that in earlier pre-modern societies or non-Western societies, he argued in that period, uh, there was more uh, 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 an affinity with religion, religious worldviews, and there was the practice of magic, where people, by doing all kinds of rituals, were thinking they were actually controlling the natural world. Well, basically, religion was replaced by science, is his argument, and magic was replaced by technology, because technology is instrumental in many ways. It's about cause and effect, uh, it's about uh, how, uh, means and ends, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the byproduct of this development was, he argued, an erosion of religious values, right? So, so this is a, a, a large theory, very influential. Uh, and one of the quotes, very famous, he wrote in um, uh, Wissenschaft als Beruf, uh, the disenchantment of the world means that principally there are no mysterious, incalculable forces that come into play, but rather one can, in principle, master all things by calculation. So, the question that I want to raise is, is, is how does artificial intelligence uh, in general, uh, um, the technology, but also its influence on the life world, how can we relate it or align it with this thesis of a disenchantment of the world? I mean, in general, there's a lot of critique on this thesis, uh, and I will get into that later. Uh, but that is my sort of general question that I want to get into. Uh, on the one hand, I think it's very clear that uh, artificial intelligence is very much in line or even an acceleration of a disenchantment of the world. Because what we're seeing here is that we're basically outsourcing human instrumental rationality to machines. And we want to make machines think like human beings, including think, uh, thinking in terms of efficiency. Um, at the same time, this is not just philosophy, this is not just uh, 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 a theoretical construct. Uh, basically, what we're seeing at this moment in time increasingly is that our social, cultural, life world is actually also invaded by these artificial intelligences or algorithm, algorithms, as, uh, as generally uh, in a popular way is expressed. Uh, Stripas calls, uh, refers to this uh, in his work as algorithmic culture. Increasingly, our social, cultural life is dominated by algorithms uh, and all the classifications, all the control that we have, all the things we do in our human lives are increasingly uh, uh, um, uh, governed by, by algorithms. So whether we're talking about the state using the internet and algorithms to, uh, uh, to, be in, to involve themselves in digital surveillance, or whether we're talking about uh, basically the algorithms that collect our data on Facebook or Instagram 
uh, or TikTok, or whether we're talking about uh, Tinder, where uh, the machine or the algorithm knows better who we like as a romantic partner than we know for ourselves. These are basically all sort of everyday uh, contexts where we see the implementation of artificial intelligence. So in that sense, artificial intelligence is not only a sort of uh, technical uh, issue, it's not only uh, a philosophical issue in terms of what, you know, is it good or is it bad, the ethical implications, but it's increasingly, you could say, also food for thought for cultural sociologists uh, and uh, sociologists of religion in that sense, because it's part and parcel of our um, society in our uh, our own environment. So this is the, 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 the stance that I will be taking, a cultural sociological perspective. And uh, from this perspective is my argument, uh, it becomes increasingly difficult to, uh, to support the arguments that artificial intelligence or algorithms, particularly in our own societal environment, uh, are indicative of an acceleration of the disenchantment of the world. Basically, I will develop two separate or ideal, typically uh, uh, separate uh, uh, trajectories here. So, first of all, uh, I want to start the the first uh, the first development or cultural trajectory. If we're talking about uh, the spirituality of uh, of artificial intelligence, with the the talk. Uh, about uh, humanistic spirituality. Uh, in the debate amongst sociologists, sociologists of religious and people in religious studies, there's a lot of uh, a lot of talk and a lot of debate, a lot of discourse, a lot of publications, including those of myself, uh, that are about the rise and widespread uh, popularity of uh, what can be called humanistic spirituality humanistic forms of self-spirituality in the West. And obviously we're very short of time, so this is a lot of information that I have to share with you, uh, uh, but there are three dimensions that are important if we are talking about this humanistic form of spirituality. Uh, first of all, uh, it is generally uh, spirituality that, that is sought outside of the Christian churches that is very much embedded uh, and became very popular in the counterculture of the 1960s and 1970s. And if we're talking about the doctrines, uh, it's first of all very much about finding not God, a transcendent God outside of you, but it's more finding the God within or the Buddha nature or the inner nature or the divine spark uh, or the inner child. There are all kinds of vocabularies that refer to this form of self-spirituality, as Paul Hillis would have it. Secondly, uh, this type of spirituality is not so much about belief, but more about personal experience. The divine is something that you don't believe or accept because it's written in a scripture, but it's something that you experience for yourself as a person. That's a totally different epistemology in that sense. And thirdly, uh, to invoke this experience of the divine within, uh, people use natural techniques. Uh, that is, whether that is uh, uh, yoga, whether that is Zen meditation, or all kinds of spiritual, holistic uh, uh, techniques, uh, that is the way to go in this type of humanistic spirituality. So here you see some of the figures, uh, uh, Carl Gustav Jung, uh, the Bhagwan, or Osho, as he was later called, uh, or Eckhart Tolle, who are basically part and parcel of this type of spirituality. And to be sure, there's a lot of variety there, so there's a lot of diversity, but these are sort of the core doctrines. Um, all right. So my point here is, uh, and this is, you could say, also a hypothesis or uh, a thesis that I want to propose, uh, uh, basically, and that might be also an issue for discussion here. Uh, the first point that I want to make is that basically we're increasingly seeing that this humanistic spirituality is complemented by another type of spirituality that's very much grounded in and based on uh, technological uh, developments. Uh, so, indeed, biotech, nanotech, AI, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and going a little 
uh, a little taking a little step back here um, basically this is not something that i'm only proposing what we see uh, in the last years that increasingly there is a sort of revision of the spiritual counterculture uh, of the 1960s and 70s uh, and the argument is basically made that you know this, this this area the bay area in and around san francisco was not only about hippies but was also very much about hackers it was not only about humanistic luddites against technology but it was also very much about spiritual technophiles so this is a sort of wing of the counterculture that is increasingly in the rewriting of this uh, of this contemporary history becoming to the front basically uh, so in this discourse uh, computers and computer technology are no longer alienating ge uh, generally as it is for most typically humanistic types of spirituality but it's basically a form or it engenders or it is a means towards spiritual salvation so there's a lot of discourse here and i know i'm taking big steps uh, but in 1975, with the rise, basically, of the personal computer, very much uh, uh, developed by uh, Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs, um, uh, there was a lot of spiritual discourse about the personal computer, particularly later on in the 1980s uh, by, for instance, Timothy Leary. He's, you see him here on the left side, but also people like Ken Casey, who were very much part of the counterculture, were interested in these kind of technologies to find spiritual salvation. Um, in the 1990s, there's a lot of discourse about the internet, cyberspace, or the World Wide Web as a sort of immaterial space where people could develop in another way without their body, outside of time and space, et cetera, et cetera. And to be sure, I mean, this is a device that we're working on now. I'm actually talking through the internet at the moment without feeling very spiritual, but there was a lot of discourse in that direction. So. Personally, in my own work, I did for my PhD thesis uh, uh, fieldwork in Silicon Valley to tap into this, this, this spiritual or religious discourse about cyberspace, internet, programming, programming, and all this kind of stuff. So increasingly, you see this shifting towards biotech, nanotech, and artificial intelligence. And then we're again here with uh, Ray Kurzweil, uh, people like Eric Drexler, who wrote a book in 1980s uh, on uh, on nanotech, et cetera, et cetera. So this is now more or less increasingly the subject uh, of spiritual discourse um, with the ultimate idea that uh, basically um, uh, uh, people can, by implementing all kinds of biotech and aligning ourselves with, uh, with nanotech, um, and indeed implementing uh, uh, artificial intelligent devices in our brains, uh, it, becomes, uh, uh, it becomes possible to enhance ourselves, not only in a more or less secular way, but also increasingly is the idea, is, the, is there the possibility to become like sort of gods or even immortal gods, uh, because as Kurzweil would argue, it will be possible if we if we make the argument that the brain is basically uh, you know uh, a very uh, uh, material stuff. There's no soul. It's a very materialist interpretation, but only a vessel of information. In the nearby future, is the idea artificial intelligent machines might be able to read this information, copy it, put it in a machine or a robot or on the internet. And there, basically, we can live without the wetware, without our bodies as immortal gods, right? So I'm not interested as a, as a cultural sociologist, basically, in whether this is true or not, or feasible or not. But basically, I'm interested in the fact that these are that these are cultures, that these are beliefs, right, that are popular in and around Sil Silicon Valley. And uh, basically, Kurzweil is only one of the people expressing these. So... Perhaps this is, and I realized that actually when I made up the, the PowerPoint, I realized that I, you know, that there's a lot of information perhaps in this talk. Uh, but this brings me to my first conclusion, um, which is that if we're talking about this new type of spirituality or self spirituality, spirituality about the self, uh, the I am God motive, you could say, uh, there is my argument that we, do not only have one humanistic variety, 
but we basically have two, one humanistic and the other one more transhumanistic. And in an ontological sense, uh, the argument of the humanistic variety is that God is in our beings, right? It's within our natural beings. We are born with the divine in us. So it's more an essentialist uh, a narrative. Whereas when we talk about the transhumanistic dis discourse, it's more constructivist. It's not like we are gods. We can become gods by using technology, biotech, nanotech, and AI. And in secondly, in an epistemological sense, I argued earlier, you could say that the humanistic spirituality is about embodied experience. You experience the sacred within, whereas transhumanistic spirituality is more about this embodied information, uh, right? There is information in our body, in our brains that we can basically get out so we can make our brains immortal. So the, uh, the, 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 the ideas about uh, a salvation in that sense, so the soterial, soteriology, soteriology uh, is more about natural tools if we're talking about the humanistic variety, and it's indeed more about technical tools in the transhumanistic uh, variety. So this is a sort of ideal typical scheme uh, that is uh, the first part, basically, uh, of my talk and the first thesis, you could say, or hypothesis that we might want to talk about afterwards. Um, the second part uh, is, uh, is more about uh, AI itself, the way we look at AI in our societies, in our cultures, as human beings, right? And like I said before, there is no doubt about it. If you talk with techie people, they could explain basically a lot about the, the rationality of it. If A, then B, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of logic, obviously, in the, in the algorithms that are embedded in our, uh, in our environment, uh, basically in our social media environments uh, uh, and in all kinds of devices around us. At the same time, uh, and you could argue, but this is also very uh, tent tentative, uh, also the experts, people like Bruno Latour and many, many other authors make the argument that technology, particularly, of course, for you know normal human beings, not techie people, uh, um, and not educated uh, as programmer, uh, these technologies are impossible or difficult to represent in their minds, right? They are invisible, they are non-transparent, and experienced as out of control, right? You could take indeed the algorithms that collect our data on the internet as an example. They are rational, but from the human cultural perspective, they are also in, you know, they are also uh, considered to be in invisible, non-transparent and out of control. They are, as uh, Latour would have it, black boxes. You know how to deal with them. There's an input and there's an output, but what is in between, we don't know. It's behind the icons, it's behind the simulations on our computers, what's really going on, right? So that is one of the elements that is, I think, important if we look at AI from a cultural perspective. Um, this, to a certain extent, we, uh, is, and now I'm coming to my, my, my second point then, to the conclusion of my second point already, um, is that you could say that, indeed, if for people uh, 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 artificial intelligence is embedded in the fabric of our technological environment, is, is considered uh, invisible, uh, non-transparent, and dif uh, difficult to represent, basically, uh, that, that it's basically, you could say, a mysterious, incalculable force. That is exactly what Weber talked about when he was talking about the disenchantment of the world, right? Through the use of technology, we can control the world, and through this control, we, can, we, don't, we are no longer tapping into uh, or invoking mysterious, incalculable forces, as we did in the more or less magical worldview. Right, so what we see here is a development where we we are in a situation uh, that brings us, you know, and I'm I'm exaggerating here, to in a certain extent 
back to the uh, to the pre-modern world. In a, in a way, you could make the argument, I know it's very sweeping, but you could make the argument that we as late moderns are dealing with our techno technological world in a way uh, as pre-moderns did with, our, with their natural world in that sense. And you could also align these, uh, these developments with, uh, with some of the classical anthropologists or sociologists uh, or, uh, who wrote about uh, the more at the beginning of religion, basically, right? For instance, uh, uh, Merritt uh, made the argument that feelings of awe, a mixture of fear and fascination, uh, is the core, basically the basic emotion uh, that is uh, that you find in every religion. So whether you're talking about a transcendent god, or whether you're talking about an, the 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 imminent divine, or whether you're talking about um, uh, spirits um within matter uh the sense is very much a combination of fear for something that is so powerful and fascination for what it can actually do right um uh, and also in that sense the influence that it has over everyday life so if we sort of apply these concepts to the way people perceive uh, uh artificial intelligence uh, algorithms uh, at this moment in time, but also perhaps increasingly in the nearby future, uh, then we could make the argument indeed that this is a veritable re-enchantment of AI. Secondly, and more concretely, and I published some stuff on this, uh, you could make the argument uh, even further that more or less uh, animistic ideas about nature, so seeing uh, uh, the spirits in the sky, in the oceans, in the clouds, in the mountains, uh, uh, which is conceptualized very much by uh, by Edward Bernard Tyler. Uh, these are there are developments now where people talk about uh, uh, digital environments, AI environments in a more or less animistic way. So what I did, amongst others, is uh, in 2002 published an article where I did an analysis on the discourse about AI uh, in Wired magazine, which is obviously a uh, 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 an outlet, a very popular outlet uh, for the discourse about new technology. And I made a uh, sort of developed the idea that this is very similar to, 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 to animism, but it's very much focused on the digital environment instead of focused on the natural environment. So just to, uh, one, ending with one of the quotes of, uh, of one of my respondents then in Silicon Valley, I did interviews with uh, with a 35, uh, 35 or 40 uh, programmers, ICT pioneers, uh, uh, and people writing about technology. And one of them was a programmer in Silicon Valley making the argument, the future will look very much like the way our ancestors thought their world would look like. Artificial intelligences, those will be our spirits because once we've built them, they will be too complex for us to understand. These are things that are greater than thou. So I guess I talked quite fast, perhaps too fast, perhaps there was too much information, uh, but this is basically uh, uh, the core argument that I wanted to uh, develop in this talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steph, for the interesting presentation. Uh, we have 20, 25 minutes of time for questions, so feel free to post in the chat to let us know if you want to ask something to Professor Alpers about his presentation. Okay, so maybe in the meantime, I can ask you something. So clearly feel free to write while, while I'm talking. Um, you were speaking about algorithms a lot. And one thing I was wondering about is that increasingly, even in the let's say, tech industry, uh, you start to see a lot of um, very relevant researchers like Timnit Gebru, um, Joy Bolumwini, 
uh, etc talking about the, the pitfalls of algorithms about potential biases and errors in this human made uh, mm -hmm. constructs mm -hmm. so i wanted you to to elaborate a little bit more on uh, the presumed objectivity and neutrality of these uh, artifacts because these are artifacts at the end of the day yeah yeah well i th i think uh, uh perhaps two two, uh, two points here i think that uh um um looking at technology as uh, as indeed sort of neutral technology uh, may in itself uh, uh be a problem um uh, there is obviously a, 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 a large discipline on, on uh, the social construction of technology, where obviously the argument is that we are increasingly sometimes have a particular amnesia about the fact that these are human-made products and that there are actually values, human values, always embedded within technology, right? So, I mean, for instance, the personal computer, I think, is always... The, uh, one of the, perhaps one of the best uh, examples of that is that we're basically that that was basically very much uh, motivated by a a cultural movement uh, that wanted to bring computer power to individual people. So hence, the technology is more or, li or more or less a, a form of foss uh, fossilized culture in that sense. And you could make the same argument, I think, about artificial intelligence. Right? I mean, artificial intelligence is not constructed in a vacuum, but it's basically essentially uh, a simulation of our uh, of our, the way our mind functions in that sense. And also the primity in our culture on cognition, on, on, uh, on, on using our brains in a very instrumental way, uh, on memory, on, uh, on all these kind of functions. So that is one. And secondly, uh, all the failures in technology uh, and you know, I try to make it as empirical as I can. I mean, most of the people that I talk to, the programmers and the uh, IC pioneers, would make the argument that the problem of failures in technology is also that people use some of the software that is already written, sometimes years ago. Uh, uh, so there are layers of technology uh, that people use over and over again. So human failures are also part and parcel of that technology itself. So um, um, is, that an, is that an answer to your question? Uh, now we have four questions. Uh, Paulo Costa is the first. So Paulo, the floor is yours. <clears throat> thank you. Um, if you can hear me, well, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, um, my question is on an, an, a different interpretation of the notion of disenchantment, especially in, in Weber, you know, mm -hmm. um, there is a sense in which Weber is telling us that uh, life has no meaning, life as such has no meaning, of yeah. course, and so rationality teaches this lesson. So my question is, do you see um, a space in this form of re-enchantment for a different kind of this kind of re-enchantment. So, uh, yeah, it's very can, you, can you imagine, yes, Kurzweil telling us that we should live forever because life has meaning, is splendid, is meaningful, is wonderful, or not? Because this is, I think, is a very important aspect of the question. Because this kind of re-enchantment seems to be simply not understandable to these people. And I, I think this is a very interesting aspect of this yeah. situation. So thank you very much. Well, th well, thank you very much for this. This is a great question. I think what you're hinting at is indeed the sort of two dimensions in the work of Weber. Uh, on the one hand, it's the erosion of uh, powerful uh, uh, forces, basically, uh, uh, incalculable forces. But the second dimension is very much about meaning, right? And, and, and the argument of disenchantment there is, is that we are losing meaning like a physician can sort of uh, prolong your life or extend your life better than a priest, but it can in no way explain why it's worth living, right? Uh, so science, and that's the paradox, uh, brings us closer to reality, but at the same time undermines meaning. That is, you know, that's a fascinating paradox in his work, I would say. Um, well, the, personally, I think, I, I mean, uh, well, empirically, the interesting, if you take uh, Kurzweil, for instance, 
uh, well, he is actually, uh, well, not explicitly, but implicitly making the argument that life as it is should be saved, right? That life as it is, is meaningful in and of itself without necessarily developing a narrative why it is worth actually uh, prolonging it. And obviously, I mean, this is also a cultural, it, it's an issue of debate because uh, I think the humanists, were, for instance, would make the argument that this kind of transhuman forms of spirituality are actually the summum of disenchantment in the way you were talking about it. Uh, because we need, you know, for instance, a deadline. You know, I personally, I would say it's good that I have the, you know, the future perspective that I can die and that my body will, you know, will, will, will end basically because I like deadlines. And it's because of deadlines that, that, that life is, has meaning. So this is, I would say, a debate rather than a, a, a position that you can take. And as a cultural sociologist, I'm more interested in this sort of debate about this. But for me, it's interesting to see that people like Kurzweil and others are implicitly arguing that indeed, it's not only that these are new, you know, sort of religious powers and that there is, you know, eternity uh, in the future, but also that that gives meaning. And I actually doubt it. So I want to see the sort of cultural debate, the different positions on that, instead of sort of uh, essentially taking a position in that myself, right? That 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 is my. Uh, I mean, some people are horrified by this perspective, and I I would be very interested in 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 analyzing the discourse about that rather than taking a position. Thank you. It's a it's a it's a great question. Now we have a question from Maxine Lem, uh, who is asking whether you see these developments uh, as positive or negative from an ethical perspective. <laughs> well, my, my question, my, 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 and, and, and excuse me for, I mean, this sounds like I'm, I'm evasive uh, and avoiding taking position. I, I understand that that's what you think. You can ask me personally what I think. I mean, personally, I think it's, it's horrifying. Uh, like I said before, um, but I think, and that is again my cultural position. I think I think people can they take different positions in that, uh, um, uh, and it, I think, and I also want to sort of challenge people to take a sort of universal ethical perspective in that, and sort of also ground it in a way um, to say whether it's good or whether it's bad. It's the dilemma of the matrix, basically. Are you taking the red pill? Or are you taking the blue pill? Do you want to stay with reality and die early, uh, or do you want to take the uh, uh, sorry? Do you want to take the uh, the red pill and and understand that we're basically uh, uh, mortal beings, or do, do you want to take the 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 the, the, the blue pill and, and and sort of live forever? These kind of dilemmas are the ethical dilemmas, and personally, I'm more interested in these ethical dilemmas than taking a position in that. Personally, I think it's horrifying, but I'm then perhaps a humanist, right? I think it's the debate between the humanists and the transhumanists here that we're talking about. Thank you. Uh, now we have a question from Incan Prol. Incan, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Steph, for the presentation. I enjoyed it very much, however, mm -hmm. So you just talked about universal questions and you are talking about people, but we only saw white Caucasians in your presentation. And um, this is uh, giving me that um, I don't know what to, what to do with this, uh, particularly as you are from culture or sociology, uh, from, from culture studies or sociology. And I have two questions. Um, when I saw the pictures first of Tolle and Bakwan, and then this woman, the, the only woman, but somehow floating, dancing, whatever, this is what women are doing and the whole thing. And then we saw the pictures of Kurzweil and all the other guys. I, For the first time I thought perhaps the whole self-spirituality thing, which I think is really a good, a good, very good hypothesis, that was male dominated from the very beginning too. And this uh, became uh, the flow of the techno spirituality, maybe just what I thought today. 
Uh, first question, and then the second question is, why should women care? Because it, it seems to be, I mean, it seems to be that this, these are dreams of white old men about technological whatever, um, technological paradises um, uh, they want to create. Yeah, so, so this is the question about gender, I guess. <laughs> um, uh, I, I think it's a, I think it's a good question, and I was uh, actually one of my uh, PhD students was also doing a sort of follow up in uh, in Silicon Valley on on these kind of techno spiritual utopian ideas, and one of her claims was uh, that these kind of discourses this is she argued new age for men, uh, right? It, in the sense that uh, also demographically, I mean, if you look at uh, a new age, what was called new age, nobody's talking about new age anymore. But if you look at, uh, in, into humanistic spirituality, you see in general that about 80% of the uh, of the practitioners uh, in these holistic forms of spirituality are women, whereas particularly the vocal people in this discourse are very much uh, uh, men. Um, so you could say that there's a sort of Intrinsic, uh, or intrinsic, not intrinsic, but the correlation uh, with masculinity here. Yeah, just Dominique, one follow up question. Yeah. You ask if this is a question of gender. No, yeah. it's not. Yeah. It is the question about humanity. Because mm -hmm. my question would be if the androcentric perspective of the whole thing perhaps has something to do with the horrifying scenario you were describing to us. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I totally understand your question. Yes. Um, you said this is a gender question, and I would like to say that this is not a gender question, but a question, a culture uh, studies question about humanity, not about gender. Mm -hmm. first mm -hmm. thing. And mm -hmm. then I would, as you said, gender question, I would like to ask perhaps the mm -hmm. horrifying scenario you described to us has something to do with the androcentric perspective of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in, in that sense, uh, yeah, I, I think that there is a definitely a relation there. I mean, uh, um, uh, obviously there is, and that is also part and parcel of this debate about transhumanism, uh, that is very much, very much centered on, uh, on human beings, right? On, on humans developing themselves. Uh, um, and not very much, I mean, there's also a lot of debate about what basically will it do for in, in terms of uh, inequality, for instance, who will get these devices to develop themselves and what will it do in a more societal sense or a more ecological sense with, uh, with, with our ecological, ecological environment in that sense. So humans in that sense are at the center of this, of this discourse. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, Lorenzo Cortesi would like to uh, comment on the presentation. Lorenzo, uh, feel free to turn on your mic. We thank you very much for uh, the uh, presentation. Uh, what I would like to point out is that uh, perhaps there is a, a, an X factor which could uh, possibly uh, link uh, in a very interesting way, uh, the uh, spirit, the uh, human spirituality, and the uh, the, the transhumanistic uh, spirituality, in the sense that what relates, what the technology can borrow from uh, the field of traditional uh, religion experience, is uh, the uh, uh, the experience. Uh, of uh, creative impulse, which can be uh, experienced in both uh, active and passive way, because religion in the past uh, taught the human being to perceive himself or herself as a created being, and this is a, a formidable. Uh, a uh, formidable hint for 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 him to uh, create uh, something in turn uh, but the the process 
of creation is uh, on one hand on the one hand uh, an act of uh, projection of uh, himself uh, that can on the other hand uh, have also uh, a certain amount of uh, unpredictability because every time you create something you can also risk to lose the control of, on over what you are actually creating. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's a very interesting point in my opinion, which could uh, 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 take our discussion uh, further. Okay. Um... I think to a certain extent, I mean, if you, uh, and I'm not sure if I answered your question in that sense, but uh, if you look at the, the developments of, uh, of, these, uh, of these technical disciplines, uh, you will always see that the a creative impulse, whether that is religious or not, motivated by religion or not, uh, you see uh, in many ways that, that this is um, a very uh, uh, important motiv uh, motivation. At the same time, what, in, what I'm interested in and also why it's uh, so very good in line with some of the stuff that Max Weber wrote about is that what we see here clearly uh, is the, um, the unintended consequences uh, of a purposive, uh, uh, of, 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 of social action, basically, right? People are creative, have different ideas, construct technologies, but in the end, uh, these machines bite back, basically. Whereas at the same time, uh, this is what we could say as an outsider. But the interesting stuff is that people like Kurzweil, uh, but also Hans Moravec, uh, and a lot of the people working on these in this field are actually welcoming these unintended consequences as being part and parcel of a natural environment of evolution, right? If these are our mind children, we are basically have to compete with them. Uh, it's in that sense, like, I mean, there's this famous article uh, by Bill Joy, um, uh, the director of, of Sun Microsystems, I think, uh, who wrote about why the future doesn't need us. And also making the claim that what we see here is very much similar to, uh, to Oppenheimer, basically creating the atomic bomb, uh, being fascinated by the scientific possibilities but was basically shocked by seeing what it actually does. So that is why I'm also intrigued by these, that by these transhumanists, that it seems that they're very enthusiastic uh, about developments that are essentially totally undermining uh, 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 humanity to a certain extent, or very literally, uh, because we're entering a, a transhuman and post-human society. So this is, you know, the sort of unforeseen and unintended result of creativity in that sense. Thank you very much, Steph. Thank you, Lorenzo, for your comment. Uh, we have just a couple of minutes and three more questions. So I'll pass the floor swiftly to uh, Gufran Kir Ala. Yes, hello. Thank you for the... Okay, how can I change the camera? Here I am. Okay. Okay. okay, it was the children's house on the other side of the room. Okay, thank you for the presentation. It's really interesting. Um, I am a linguist. I come from the analysis, the uh, critical discourse analysis. So um, in my study, I study how the language reflects our mental framing of the abstract word. So according to the vocabulary the people use, you can understand how they think of abstract mm -hmm. concepts. Uh, you start your presentation talking about the secular mind, okay? You mm -hmm. said that the secular mind replaced the magic by technology, and that's true, you see it, right? Um, um, the point is that uh, in a moment in, that, in, in your presentation, I just lost the limits between secularity and religion. Since most of people who, who believe in artificial intelligence are secular, how it comes be to talk about transhumanistic spirituality because the secular mind mm -hmm. doesn't um, admit the spiritual part of human being, you know that? Mm -hmm. So how, how can we uh, just drill that 
line between secularity and religion. Yeah, yeah. We talk about that. It's just for, for me, I was just for a moment talking, okay, yeah. are we talking about secular mind or religious mind? Uh, yeah. At the same time, uh, the, the other question is um, the use of terminology. When, uh, when, uh, when they talk about the immortal gods that the human body can be, so what is the definition of God in that sense? Because God, it's mm -hmm. just a very huge concept. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. I'm a linguist. I always go to the, the semantic meaning of uh, yeah. terms. And, uh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. okay, I will stop here. There are a lot of questions. Um, it's a very interesting topic. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I think uh, thank you for that question. That's a very that's a very good question, and um, and I agree that I didn't sort of uh, elaborate. Uh, 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 I have not elaborated uh, too much on the relation between the secular and the religious, uh, and to a certain extent, I end up in an overly characteristic of a, a sort of caricature or ideal type of a dichotomy between the secular and the religious. And, you know, all the theoretical work and empirical work done in that direction obviously shows that these are very, very different, dist difficult distinctions. And I'm pretty, pretty aware of that. Um, uh, if I look at the case study, I would say, well, historically, we know from different studies that, that these theories, you know, also the theory of Max Weber, but also secularization theories in general, are, uh, are very problematic because they make this constructist dichotomy. Right, for various reasons. Uh, if we look empirically, for instance, on the, uh, on the history of technology, uh, you already see that there's a hybrid between the secular and religious. Even with, the, with, the, with the, uh, the, the, the invention and the popularization of the telegraph, there was a mixture of technological discourse and, and discourse about uh, uh, communication with the spirits, right? So there's a lot of case studies on that as an example. Um, 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 so, so it, that is basically is one of my points here, and I think this this discussion or this presentation didn't make it clear enough. One of my main points is that what we're witnessing here is a is a paradox or a hybrid, a paradox in the sense that there is a, you know a religious dream of salvation and immortality. Uh, um, you can call it God or gods or whatever you can call it, uh, but it's based on basically a radical materialistic and scientific worldview. I mean, they can on, people like Kurzweil can only talk about uploading consciousness and becoming spirits uh, by accepting the scientific uh, uh, assumption that, our, that there is no soul, that our brains are just material stuff and that there's a byproduct that we call consciousness. Uh, and if we can get to that information, we can imitate it, simulate it, and download it, right? So here you see the paradox, and the hybrid is also in the discourse, right? I mean, it's secular technology is a mean uh, towards a religious goal. This is a sort of typology that you cannot find in Weber's, of, this is a, a hybrid that you don't find in Weber's discourse. He is talking about secular means used towards secular goals, right? We use technology, for instance, uh, to become more efficient, to, you know, uh, uh, to, to make coffee or to, uh, to drive a car or whatever we do. But here you see that technical means are related to religious goals. So it, it's, it's exemplifying a hybrid of the secular uh, and the religious, I would say. So my to a certain extent implicitly some mo, a lot of my work is very much informed by bruno latour in that sense uh, making basically the claim and i don't know if you know this book like uh, we've never been modern where he makes this claim we as moderns increasingly think in terms of religious sacred uh, scientific political uh, all these dichotomies objects subjects they are all sort of divorced thinking modern is thinking in terms of dichotomies uh, and indeed, the secular and the sacred is one of them, whereas I, in a Latourian sense, try to demonstrate, and that was not very part of this des demonstration, but that it's, that it's too simple to talk about either believing or not believing, talking about religious or secular. Now, these things are intertwined. So that was a very long answer, I guess, but hopefully uh, that gives a, an idea of where I stand. Thank you. <laughs>
Okay, thank you. And uh, now it's 5 p.m., but from the direction they are saying me that we can go on for a couple of extra minutes to cover the last two questions. So now it's uh, Vicky Landil's turn. So feel free to turn on your mic and ask questions. The floor is yours. Vicky? We can't hear you. Yeah, okay. sorry, I was having a little bit of problem. So thank you very much, Professor Aupers, for your interesting presentation. Um, so considering that for many people, virtual spaces represent also an environment to perform religious activities, as mm -hmm. for example, for techno pagans, then do you consider that this re-enchantment can actually open new forms of religiosity with their own rituals and eventually sacred spaces? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I, I I wrote some stuff about techno pagans actually, uh, um, and I uh, to be to be honest, I don't know if they even still exist these techno pagans at the moment. But uh, particularly in the time that I did field work in Silicon Valley, they were very actually very vocal and wrote all kinds of articles and pamphlets and uh, uh, and it was also uh, there there was also in in studies on paganism. There was also always the, the sort of uh, 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 argument that pagans were very much interested in computer technology. So there is a sort of affinity there. Uh, some, on the one hand, cre making the holistic argument that you know there is no distinction between technology and nature, and therefore creating sort of worldwide sacred space uh, uh, on the internet. Uh, but on the other hand, there was indeed the sort of attraction uh, to technology as a sort of uncontrollable natural force, right? So these are sort of two elements that you'll find in in techno paganism, and I think I think techno paganism illustrates, uh, which is important, I think, that that also that uh, from a cultural perspective, uh, people are uh, that that the, again the dichotomy between technology and nature is a modern dichotomy that is uh, deconstructed by many people in everyday life, right? Yeah. Uh, while we're sitting here talking to one another, we might have, for instance, as an example, we might have more intimate conversations uh, than when, we, when we're face to face. Yeah. So what does that mean? That means basically that technology is not necessarily artificial and hence alienating, which is something that in our modern mindset is very much uh, uh, an idea. So that is, I think, some of the stuff that techno pagans, uh, as an example, a case study demonstrate. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Now we have the, the final question by Adelton. In, um, he actually wrote in the, in the chat, so I will try to summarize the question to you. Um, Adelton basically writes that during the pandemic times, um, the, the, the masses were actually uh, held uh, online, while on one side this meant that uh, the practice wasn't direct, on the other we, we had people uh, attending the masses that didn't do it before. So he is actually asking whether this is, according to you, a form of enchantment or disenchantment. Well, again, this is a... <laughs> I mean, talking in terms of it's either enchantment or, or, or disenchantment is, is, is way too simple, I think. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure, I mean, that, that uh, again, uh, and I think this aligns with the question before this, uh, to a certain extent, that people can have veritable, authentic, spiritual experiences when they are online. I mean, in addition, obviously, to the sort of, you know, the church using the internet to mobilize people to enter the masses and to pray together, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I, I wouldn't say uh, necessarily that this is, you know, part and parcel of a disenchantment of the world. I mean, it's the medium basically that mediates the uh, the uh, the experience of religious people. Uh, and you could say, I mean, there's the interesting uh, work, I think, of Birgit Meyer. Uh, she wrote a lot on uh, the element of mediation in, uh, in religion, in religious group, doing field work in Ghana, in Africa, uh, but also sort of generalizing it in, uh, uh, in a theoretical sense, making the claim that basically every religious experience is mediatized and not only mediated, but mediatized. 
um, uh, whether that is uh, through the use of, 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 of rituals, uh, by, by uh, uh, the use of uh, particular uh, 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 symbols, or the use of, uh, 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 of real media forms, right? I mean, uh, her argument basically is, if we say that, the, in your words, that, that, that uh, mediating or mediatizing religion through the internet is a disenchantment, we're neglecting the empirical examples uh, that demonstrate that basically every religious meeting is mediatized, right? We need symbols. Well, particularly, you could say this is the not the Protestant, but more the Roman Catholic uh, 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 element here. I mean, Roman Catholics more than Protestants, of course. I mean, this is the core difference. Uh, use rituals, symbols, uh, images to get to the sacred. So it's mediatized. But there is no fundamental and ontological difference between uh, using a painting or using an image or using a statue or using a, you know, a technological medium. Uh, it's difficult, I think, to make that distinction. So no, I would say, well, now I get to the point that I get more clear, perhaps. I think it's too easy to say it's disenchantment because, you know, every religion has mediation. And, me and it doesn't necessarily lead to a sort of inauthentic or not real religious experience, I would say. Hopefully that's an answer to your question. Now, thank you very much. I would like to, to continue this conversation, but uh, we are already over time. So uh, I will soon pass uh, the floor to Boris Rem for the final words. I just want to uh, thank uh, Steph Alpers for his speech today and for all the participants and your questions actually. So Boris, if you want to conclude yeah. this session, feel free to go on. Yeah. So, uh, Steph, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting talk and thank you to you, Dominic, for sharing this and to everyone um, who participated or just listened uh, and watched um, in, the uh, in the discussion.